All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event on a very important and timely topic, the Presidential Records Act. From Nixon to Trump, how the PRA preserves our history. This event is sponsored by NYU's John Bradamus Center, named after former congressman and NYU President John Bradamus, who, among other things, helped to write the Presidential Records Act. Also sponsored by the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law, a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and defend our systems of democracy and justice, and by NYU Votes, a university-wide initiative to ensure that all eligible voters in the NYU community, thank you, uh, great, are, are able to, uh, now you can hear me, uh, are able to cast their votes. My name is Dan Weiner. I serve as a director in the Elections and Government Program at the Brennan Center. So before we get started, I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, we're going to leave time for questions at the end. I know that there are many people watching over Zoom. Uh, this is a hybrid event. Please feel free to put your questions in the Zoom at any time, and we will get to them after uh, the at the latter part of our event. Second, civility is very important. Those who post rude or offensive comments in the Zoom will be removed from the conversation. And lastly, we are providing closed captioning for this event. There's an option if you are on Zoom, you can check on it and uh, you can have access to that. So now on to tonight's program. Um, the Presidential Records Act is one of those absolutely critical federal laws that present company accepted most Americans uh, probably have not heard of. It establishes public ownership and uh, of all documents created or received by the president, the vice president, and their staffs in the course of carrying out the duties of the presidency. Documents that are deemed to have historical or other evidentiary value have to be turned over to the National Archives when each president leaves office, and eventually many of them become available uh, for uh, to researchers and others, and they form a crucial part of the historical record that helps us to understand uh, events in our country's past. Um, the PRA, uh, you may have heard, is also now at the center of a uh, pretty notable scandal involving former President Trump and his apparent uh, decision to retain custody of documents after he left office. But as we will discuss tonight, in fact, uh, every uh, recent president has chafed at the requirements of the PRA to some degree. Um, and we'll talk about that history tonight. And we'll talk about why uh, the preservation of presidential records is still so critical. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our panel. Um, in alphabetical order. Uh, sitting next to me, Farnoosh Amiri uh, is congressional reporter at the Associated Press, where she has covered the Trump Mar-a-Lago scandal and Congress's response, as well as related controversies around uh, the President Biden's nominee to head the National Archives. Uh, prior to joining the AP, she worked at NBC News. She has a master's degree from NYU's Arthur L. Clarke Journalism Institute, and she grew up in Southern California, which I hear is home to several notable presidential libraries. Um, next, we have Bob Bauer. Bob serves as professor of practice and distinguished scholar in residence at NYU School of Law, where he also co-directs NYU's legislative and regulatory process clinic. He served as White House counsel uh, to President Obama from 2009 to 2011, and he co-chaired two presidential commissions on election administration and on the Supreme Court. He's also a longtime member of the election law bar and one of our nation's leading experts on the democratic process. Lindsay Chervinsky is a presidential historian. She has written two books, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution, and the forthcoming An Honest Man, The Inimitable, I always mess up that word, The Inimitable Presidency of John Adams. 
She serves as a columnist for two venerable publications here in DC, Governing and Washington Monthly, writes and speaks widely for other outlets, hosts a podcast on presidential history, and I have to say my personal favorite, created an audible course on the best and worst presidential cabinets. And afterwards, I think I might want to see, you know, where, where various ones rank. And then finally, last but not least, we have Tim Naftali, serves as clinical associate professor of public service and clinical associate professor of history at NYU, where he directs the university's undergraduate public policy major. Prior to joining NYU, Tim served as the founding director of the federal Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum, where he authored the library's exhibit on Watergate and presided over the release of 1.3 million pages of presidential documents. And Tim is also a very noted scholar of the Cold War and other topics in modern American history. So with that, um, I think, Lindsay, I'd like to start with you. Um, so the idea of presidential records as um, public property is, is a relatively modern innovation, but I, I would assume that didn't mean that past presidents before that uh, were indifferent to their place in the historical record. Um, I'm wondering, can you tell us, are there, are there themes um, that emerge from prior U.S. history about how presidential records were handled before the Presidential Records Act was enacted? Um, and, and how did presidents view this as part of preserving, uh, you know, a record of their administrations for posterity? Well, thank you so much for having me here. This is uh, such a great topic and so, of course, relevant to our current moment. And that's a great place to start. So many of the, oh, I need to turn on my microphone. So sorry. Okay, I want to make sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, it's a great place to start with the early presidents because it was really an individual choice. It depended on who was in office, what was their sense of history, what was their sense of their own place in history, and then, of course, how they died and their family's attention to those details. So, for example, someone like George Washington was acutely aware of his letters and the importance that they would have for the record after he was gone. He started cultivating them while he was still in the Revolutionary War and then as president as well. And he actually opened them up to sort of early researchers in his retirement. Now, of course, those are the letters that he wanted to be available to researchers. He asked his wife, Martha, to burn their correspondence after he died and she complied. So we only have a couple letters between the two of them. And I suspect that's actually where all the good stuff would have been. Uh, all the, the gossip and the grudges and the things we really wanna get at. So they had complete control over what was left behind. Now, someone like Zachary Taylor, who died in office and whose presidency is not particularly well remembered or remembered at all, left much less of an evidentiary record because A, he died in office and then sort of was forgotten to history. And so there are far fewer records that have been preserved in one place. So I think the, the parallels that we can think of is it really depends on the person, their mindset, the importance of how they saw their role in history, and then how they left office and their family's commitment to upholding that tradition. I'm thinking of um, that great song in Hamilton, the musical about burning all the letters. So there, there was a little bit of probably historical accident there of, of how you, how you, uh, what happened. But obviously that's not um, how we do things today. And so Tim, I'm wondering if you could walk us through the origins of uh, the, the decision to make presidential records public property in Watergate. Um, and, and maybe tell us a little bit about how the system works today. And also, I mean, critically, you know, as a historian, why you think it's so important that presidential records belong to the public? Well, uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. See, um, and it's very nice to call on uh, Lindsay. Um, you know, turn, maybe you turn your mic on too. Let's try that one. Thank you very much. Of course. Slight technical difficulties, <laughs> but okay, got it. There it's we go. Me not look bad. I appreciate that. Ah, that 
that was never a worry. <laughs> you look great. You're you you were great. Okay, so so I, I, the first thing that I think we need to drill down on and is that for all of our effort to create a responsible government, a government checked by other institutions, separations of powers, there's this big gap in the system. And, and it was a, a flaw. It's obviously a flaw in the system. And the flaw was that, the, that the, the documentation of the presidency was private property. That is a fundamental flaw in the system. Um, and in a sense, it was a, an adoption of a British tradition where the monarch's papers belong to the monarch. And uh, for reasons that I don't know, um, maybe Lindsay does, George Washington decided to set this precedent. And it was, it's a very bad thing for the country because it allowed every subsequent president to make the decision uh, that George Washington made, which is to decide what to destroy. And for that reason, our record of presidencies before the modern era is incomplete. Um, we just don't have the records that you would expect for many of our presidencies. Now, the office of the president expands, becomes more important, but uh, we are reliant, as Lindsay said, on the vicissitudes of the personalities and the families and the moment in time uh, to determine whether or not the record is, 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 is robust. So come into the 20th century and our country uh, has continued this tradition. And the way it worked in the 20th century was we, we did not give presidents pensions until 1958. So our presidents um, were basically unemployed once they left office. Um, and some of them were, were vital enough to have, were, were able to work again. Many of them did. Some of them tried to live off of their fame. Um, some of them became penniless. Um, uh, our system of government didn't know really what to do about former presidents. In 1913, I think, uh, Andrew Carnegie thought perhaps he would set up a foundation to help uh, former presidents survive. And Congress said that would be wrong. So their papers were a source of money. Um, that's why this matters, that presidents needed to sell papers or at least gift them to the US government and get a huge tax deduction because we didn't provide for them in any other way. Um, the answer to why it changes, I wish were that the American people decided they wanted a better record of presidential action. Boy, that would be a great story because it would be a story of democracy and a desire for transparency, but that's not the answer. The answer is Richard Nixon. That's not always the answer for things like the, the, the big changes, but it's Richard Nixon. And it's Richard Nixon and it's Gerald Ford. Um, to make a very long story short, um, we, we, have, we own now our president's records because Gerald Ford made a mistake. Um, Gerald Ford, and, and it's not his fault, okay? But Gerald Ford comes into office, it's totally unprecedented. No president had ever resigned before. No president ever resigned with a, an indictment or two hanging over his head. And President Nixon left so many documents on the fourth floor of the executive office building that the Secret Service was afraid the, build, the floor would actually collapse. <laughs> That's how many documents were left. In addition, there were, it depends on the, the figures, about 880 um, reels of tape. Most of them were bought at the then equivalent of the CVS. They were very flimsy um, and they were all gathered together also in the executive office building. One day, a moving van pulls up and President Ford had continued in office President Nixon's chief of staff, Alexander Haig the I'm in charge guy of the Reagan era, era. And the president and actually his team wondered what's going on. And they said, stop to the process of moving the materials to the, to the former president's home in San Clemente. And they asked the justice department who owns the papers. <laughs> 
This matter was extremely important, not just for historians, though I think we were really important, <laughs> but because there were a bunch of lawsuits that were in the air, not simply the famous Watergate ones, but there was a lawsuit regarding people who had died at Wounded Knee. And there were many people who were seeking, who were already actually had issued subpoenas for pres presidential records. And so President Ford's team asked the Justice Department who owns the records and the Justice Department's lawyer, who is a man named, you may have heard of him, Antonin Scalia, would write, presidents own them. Nixon owns these papers. Well, the Ford people thought, oh my God, if he takes these papers, we could be involved in an obstruction of justice case ourselves. We could be subpoenaed. So Ford decides that he's got to get Nixon to sign something that gives his administration the right to enter the paper, to use the papers. And that's the origins of the pardon. The pardon is a, happens for a number of reasons, but part of it is the Ford, the Ford administration needed Nixon to agree to a deposit agreement for these records because otherwise they faced obstruction of justice problems because Nixon wanted everything sent to California and they had no legal standing to stop it. So the pardon agreement, the less famous part of the pardon agreement was Nixon agreeing to a deposit agreement, which didn't give the US government ownership over the papers, but control. And this now brings us to Congress because this agreement, which was all wrapped up with the pardon, gave Nixon the right to destroy the tapes within 10 years or at the time of his death, whichever came first. And when Congress learned that, that the executive branch had given Nixon the right to destroy tapes, destroy documents, um, destroy the tapes, Congress said, no. And, and the person who pushed that was none other than John Bradmus. Um, a Democratic congressman uh, from, in, from Indiana. Um, and he led a group of people who said, no, Nixon's papers must be government property. And that was the basis for an act that, that governs just one library. I, I was for a while the sort of the uh, uh, legatee uh, of a single law of Congress that governs the Nixon collection. It's the Presidential Records and Materials Preservation Act of 1974, say that three times, signed by Gerald Ford. Now, why did Gerald Ford sign it? Because Gerald Ford had no choice. He wasn't, his veto would have been overruled by Congress. So the very first precedent in our country, because we have a lot of lawyers here, precedent matters. The very first precedent of presidential records being federal, not federal, but public records was the Nixon collection. Now, what do you think Nixon did? Nixon was in terrible shape when he came out of office. He nearly died, but he rallied and he came back and he said, you can't do this to me. Congress cannot take my property from me. And then he called something, and I'm not a lawyer, but it's called a bill of attainder. You cannot design a law just for one person that is unconstitutional. Congress uh, had done this and it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in uh, GSA versus Nixon sided with uh, the Presidential uh, Records and Materials Preservation Act and said, it's a constitutional act. The president's very special. He's an, actually a class of one not a bill of attainder. And yes, you can do this. And the, and the country has a compelling interest in controlling these records. So that laid the basis for rethinking presidential records because Congress then said, hey, you know, this is crazy. Why have we let this happen? And this was a time when people were talking about the imperial presidency, the country had been through Watergate, the country began to investigate misdeeds by the intelligence community. And of course there had been Watergate uh, and Vietnam. I mean, I should have mentioned Vietnam. And so Congress then, and now I'll let my colleagues continue the story, passed the Presidential Records Act. It was signed by Jimmy Carter, but the process begins earlier. And it's a way of codifying the lessons learned in the Nixon story to cover all future presidents, starting with um, uh, whoever was elected in 1980. Uh, Jimmy Carter signs the law. It doesn't have a retroactive effect. Jimmy Carter actually thought it would govern him because he expected to win the 1980 election, but he doesn't. So R Ronald Reagan is the very first president governed by the 
Presidential Records Act. So I want to, oh, first I want to speak into the microphone, but I want to stop there, actually. This is a great pause point and turn to you, Bob, because you worked in the presidential administration. And, you know, to me, it does seem like uh, there is, um, despite the sort of the, the really gripping story Tim just told, um, a real tension between um, the public and posterity's right to know um, and the president's need to actually receive candid confidential advice from those around her or him. So I'd like you to maybe just tell us a little bit about um, how you approached that tension, um, because I think it's something that actually did run through every administration, and it has run through every administration that's been in office since the PRA was enacted. Certainly. As you know, or as, as many now know because of recent controversies, I mean, the PRA, uh, as uh, was just explained, gives the government uh, control of these papers operating through the National Archives with a significant role under the statute for the National Archivist, and some very curious roles for former presidents as well as for presidents. And we should come back to that if we talk about how the statute could, be, could, could be amended to clarify and address yeah. some peculiarities in the law that I don't think were detected until recently. Right. But the statute attempts to recognize the confidentiality interest by protecting from release, for example, materials that reflect presidential communications among other interests for a period of 12 years. Uh, and once those periods end, by the way, once these segregated periods, uh, there are two categories of documents are subject to different periods of release, one 12 years, one five years. But once those periods end, then they become subject to private petition or private relief under the Freedom of Information Act. And we can talk about the technicality, we can talk about the technical requirements of the statute, and I do want to come back to the former later right. in, in the appropriate moment to talk about some of the odd questions that are raised under the statute. But you're quite right, there is a tension. There are a couple of ways in which this is expressed. One which creates problems under the ERA that Congress has since tried to address, and there's still ongoing attempts to think about ways to address it further, and one of which is just unavoidable. The unavoidable one is that those who are concerned about never having what they have to say on the subject become public, and if you think about it, 12 years is not that long a period of time, right? don't write things down. End of story. They want those communications to be oral, so they're not creating presidential records. And in any administration that's administered with appropriate attention to the rule of law, the White House Counsel's Office directs a process of ensuring that those in the building are aware of their legal requirements and that records are appropriately preserved. People understand they're not to take documents uh, that are, in fact, presidential records and, for example, spirit them away when the administration ends. And that would apply to staff as well. Um, so one response to that is we lose something when the decision is made simply to keep something out of the written record. The other that can be addressed, but it's an ongoing struggle, are evasive devices like the use of private email accounts. Uh, Congress, I think it was in 2014, amended the statute to address the use of unofficial electronic media of communication. There's still some question, uh, I know Project Democracy has proposed that there be further reforms that would address, you know, instant messaging, WhatsApp, and other sorts of, other sorts of media of, com of communication. But those experiences, or what I just identified, are just examples of the tension that you're talking about, of a, a concern about anybody looking over their shoulder, not just now, but potentially in the future. By the way, I do want to mention one thing because of the reference just now to Nixon versus GSA administrator. One of the issues that Nixon raised was Congress can't do this because it's a violation of the separation of powers. And the court came to the conclusion that it wasn't because the resolution is within the executive branch, the National Archives is the responsible entity. But for those who think about imbalance within the system, bear in mind that the same records preservation requirements don't actually apply to the United States Congress. Congress is anxious to make sure that the executives preserve records, but the, 
the, for example, the Mitch McConnell papers are not subject to any sort of similar uh, sets of statutory requirements. Pardon me? FOIA is also not. You can and neither is FOIA. FOIA. Neither is FOIA. FOIA. So in Congress. terms of a presidential record over a period of time, you know, for example, during major controversies, legislative controversies, impeachments, whatever, there is a significant difference between the access or the development of the historical record and access to the historical record between the two institutions. So anyway, that uh, the goal in the White House, just to summarize, not uh, is education on the part of uh, those who work in the White House about the importance of, of how the Presidential Records Act operates and the importance of preserving documents, and then an attempt toward the end of the administration uh, to make sure that those warnings are refreshed and that all the records are appropriately, because at that point they go to the National Archives, are appropriately assembled and delivered as they should to the National Archives. That process can be chaotic because it occurs at the end of the administration. And one of my successors, Dana Remus, has suggested to me in conversation, I think it's a very good idea, that that could also be a subject of reform because it would eliminate the possibility of major mistakes occurring and material drifting away from the building that then later has to be retrieved. So and, and I want to get back to the question of reform, but but chaos. Now, so that that brings us to um, the most recent presidential transition. Um, and Farnoosh, I, I'm wondering if you uh, can give us an overview of the Mar-a-Lago uh, scandal and what exactly, because I know some of us who who don't stay glued to the TV on this might not actually have appreciated what what is alleged to have happened there um, and and what is is potentially uh, the violation of the law. Sure. Um, so as, as Bob mentioned, you know, this process begins at the beginning of every administration. You know, this isn't something they bring up, you know, a month before you have to leave office. This is a, they give you brochures, they walk you through every step of the process throughout the term of your, your administration. And that is from low level staff to obviously the president of the United States. So in the case of um, former president Donald Trump, uh, after the November election began, uh, after the November election ended, um, because of his unwillingness to concede to the election results, um, all of the normal procedures that would have taken place as far as staff making folders of where records would go, of what records need to are classified and which ones need to go, the National Archives, which ones are not presidential records, you know, which ones are personal records, diaries, all of those things, that was all pushed back. Um, a guidance that was sent out in December, according to AP reporting, um, said that you know, had initially said everyone needs to do this by this time period, January 20th is the day that the National Archive shows up and takes all of the records. Um, but because uh, Trump refused to concede to the election, um, they sent a notice out saying, do not do that. So all of this process, which as Bob just described is hectic in a normal administration, is obviously going to become much more chaotic and in some ways untenable when president, the commander in chief doesn't accept the results of the election. So what happened then is a, you know, staff members calling former record keepers, you know, former administration officials asking them what they're supposed to do. And, you know, what went on for the next few weeks until January 20th, it was delayed, the National Archives pickup was delayed, was an ad hoc throwing in boxes, you know, no serious process or any sort of guardrails to make sure that everything that needed to go to the National Archives went. And, you know, so much re public reporting has shown that while he was president, um, Donald Trump had a very interesting and unique way of handling um, records. Uh, he, you know, often, as, as Bob mentioned, didn't want people to take notes during meetings, you know, most notably with a private meeting that he had with Vladimir Putin. He made um, the interpreter rip up those notes. That happened, you know, in, in many conversations. He used other people's phones um, to make phone calls. He didn't go through the White House switchboard. These are all, you know, presidents have done this. Um, and we're all we're obviously saying this in the context of what we know now. And so the National Archives, when they 
received, you know, it's hard to know what you don't have if there isn't a log of everything you're supposed to have. And because of the chaotic transition, the National Archives, you know, started out just at a deficit of not knowing the scope of what could be missing, the scope of the documents that they were supposed to receive. And over the next year and a half, um, they, you know, communicated directly with uh, Trump's lawyers and representatives of Trump to get back everything that they could. And they were told that they had everything. Um, and so there's months of back and forth. And in January, they found out that there was 15 boxes missing and they retrieved those 15 boxes. And when they retrieved those boxes, the National Archives went through it. And that's when they realized that there was classified documents in there and also that there were things that were still missing. And under the, you know, under their, the PRA, they have a provision where the archivists can notify the FBI um, if there is something missing, if they believe it's classified, and they can, you know, decide at their discretion what to do with it. So, yeah, and actually, the the role of the archivist here is interesting. So, I wonder if you could also maybe talk a little bit about the how this is sort of spilled over into the confirmation battle over who President Biden has nominated to be the next archivist of the United States. Yeah. So, archivists' um, role are, are very unique. You know, obviously, they are nominated by a president, um, but they're often, you know, not political appointees. Um, it's usually people who have worked in, you know, historical associations who have worked as historians, as professors um, of history. And so um, when the, the archivist that was during Trump's presidency retired this past spring, saying that, you know, the events of January 6th and just the political nature of of America pushed him to the end, edge of his, you know, wanting to be the archivist. Um, Biden nominated days before the Mar-a-Lago raid in August, um, Colleen jo Shogun to be the next archivist in the United States. And this is usually not something I would cover. Um, this isn't any something anyone would pay, you know, that more. I mean, I, I, I don't want to say that about my colleagues. They probably would find that extremely important. But as a congressional reporter, it's something that comes and goes. Um, obviously, the timing of when she was nominated and the fact that she would have to be confirmed by the Senate made this notable. Um, and uh, if I don't know if many people saw, but she had a very heated uh, Senate confirmation hearing, and then the vote was tied. So, um, you know, that's still pending for her confirmation. Right. Yeah. So, uh, for uh, I thought you'd all want to know that uh, David Ferriero, who was the archivist of the United States, um, as Pernisha uh, mentioned, uh, his appointment had also been controversial. Um, his appointment, there are, senators have the right to put a hold on a confirmation. It's a secret, I'm not going to deal with this confirmation. And, and when there's a hold on it, it doesn't move. And when David Ferriero was nominated, I think in late 09 or early 2010, there was a hold place on his nomination. And uh, I remember my boss saying to me, do you have any idea why? And I said, oh, yes, I do. I was the reason. A member of the Senate uh, did not like what I was doing at the Nixon Library and wanted to have a conversation with Ferriero to change the way we approached history at the Nixon Library because the Nixon Library, we were making everything available under the law and we were actually going to have a real discussion of presidential abuses of power. And there happened to be a veteran of the Nixon administration who was a senator. His name was Lamar Alexander. And there was a lot of pressure put on Lamar to do something about me. So the meeting happened. And I'm very happy to say uh, I was not fired. Um, in fact, I didn't have to change what I was doing at all because I think in the end, the Senator just wanted his unhappiness made known to this archivist and the vote happened afterwards. But President Obama's uh, choice for archivist of the United States was actually held up for a number of months because of anger by one Senator about the legacy of Richard Nixon, which gets us to one of, I, I just want to throw into the hopper, one of the challenges for presidential record keepers 
um, or uh, is that presidents are powerful. And uh, yes, it's true that Congress has taken a role, which I know presidents have found uh, sometimes unpleasant, but I think presidents have way too much power over their legacy and make it really hard through their allies in Congress after they leave office, make it really hard to get materials out to the, to the American people. And so I think there is, there, there, is a, there is a shadowy world of pressure that exists. I was fortunate that I was responsible for a president who was not terribly popular. If I had been director, although no one would have ever made me director of the Reagan library, but if I'd been Reagan director, I would have had much more trouble getting materials out to the public because of the power that in that era, the Reagan, the Reagan family had in Congress. So I think that one of the things we have to be clear about is there is a shadowy power um, that that is, and you know, presidents are very powerful and very important to our our political culture and our government and our national security. But uh, they also, even when they leave office, retain power over their legacies, which complicates archivists' ability to get them material to the public. And actually, I, I want to, I promise you all that I will get to the subject of ex-presidents, which I know is is actually a source of great uh, concern. Um, but Lindsay, I actually, I I want, as a presidential historian, I, I, I want to take a step back here, because if, if you're watching, you know, at home or, or, or wherever, there is an understandable, don't, don't get angry at me here. There's an understandable maybe instinct to say, well, so what? Like, you know, archives, like the, that's fascinating, but we have more important things to worry about. Can you, can you just help us put this uh, discussion a little bit more as Tim started sort of in, in the broader context of the role of the presidency in American life and the president's accountability to the nation? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the so what question is a really important one. Anytime we're doing any type of history, we should have to answer the so what question. So I think there are sort of three things to keep in mind with the so what of presidential records. As Tim said, the presidency is super powerful and is the only person that represents all Americans and is, I think, arguably, and with a good, strong argument, the most powerful person in the world. Most of what happens in the White House, we don't know about. We know about what is reported on by fantastic journalists who do really hard work like Pranush, and we know what is leaked. But because of the you know, closed door nature of the White House, because of the importance to have things classified like national you know, security secrets, um, sources, nuclear information, there's a lot that we just don't know. And we won't know until much later as long as it is preserved. If it is not preserved, then we don't really know what happens. And so while the American people can hold a president accountable with the information they do have at the ballot box, everyone should be voting, by the way, if they haven't already, um, we, can, we can do our best to hold people accountable. We don't really know what to hold them accountable for until we have access to the full information. So, for example, there have been presidents like Ulysses S. Grant or Dwight Eisenhower, who, when they retired, their reputations were not so great. And then as more records became available and historians and political scientists and journalists began to study the incredible impact they actually had, we got a much better appreciation for what they actually did while they were in office. And so if we want to hold our public officials accountable, if we want to have a full understanding of what presidents have done in our history as a nation, these records are indispensable to be able to tell that story. So that's sort of the big picture accountability question. I think there are two other factors which sometimes we don't necessarily appreciate. One is we have regular transitions of power and so presidents come and they go. And if they don't leave a comprehensive record to the people that come after them, that person is very much handicapped when they come into office. This is an essential part of the transition process. And so if we want our next leader to be successful, to be effective, to do the best that they can for the nation, they have to know what has happened. And that includes things like national security information and what missions are in play. And of course there are other 
actors that are participating in these things, things like the Department of Defense, and they have their own records that they can pass along. But if we care about national security, if we care about um, the, the nation's future, we have to also care about the information being preserved and passed on to the next person that is in that big office and the people helping them. And you, several of you have mentioned this. So, so maybe Bob, because I know you've written about this subject. We do have a tendency to deify president, pre, our presidents, and and oh, yeah, yeah grab this. Grab the mic. <laughs> um, and then even when they leave office, right, they're private citizens. But actually, the regime that we've set up gives this private citizen quite a bit of of authority over these government documents and they might have even more authority when they're like lent when documents are say lent to a private foundation right so should ex presidents have any role in deciding how their records are kept and who has access to them first of all i think the deification is more than a tendency right, right? if you consider that when they're elected and uh, admittedly in the democracy it's up and down so they also can be demonized for periods of time before the deification begin resumes and sometimes that occurs well after they leave office so all of a sudden they're viewed in a different light as was just noted it isn't clear to me and this is i'm going to go to a very specific point about the pra it isn't clear to me why it is that we confer certain legal rights on ex-presidents that have a significant public interest impact, public interest impact of the kind that you just described. Um, I think it's an odd outcome because when they leave office, presidents are former presidents, uh, but they're also private citizens. They're absolutely private citizens. Uh, and yet there are various conventions. And in this case, there's actually statutory material that invest them as private citizens with authority you wouldn't think they would have. So for example, on the basis of a provision in the PRA that pro provides that an incumbent president um, has no guaranteed access to a former president's records if that information is otherwise available elsewhere. Donald Trump actually tries to prevent, has tried to prevent, President Biden from accessing the records in the 15 boxes that returned from Mar-a-Lago back to the archives on the grounds that the current president uh, had only a qualified right of access to a former president's records. And that makes no sense, consistent with the point that the current president has an absolute need of access. Um, now, granted, it's that access can be achieved under the statute if the information is not otherwise available, but it's not clear to me why there should be even that hurdle. Why should that be the case? Why shouldn't a president have unqualified access to the prior administration's records? It's not clear to me what lies behind that and what possible policy sense it makes. That's one example. Another example is uh, that it is not clear, it's never been tested, um, that a, and we know it's very much in the works now in this current controversy that an incumbent president resolves an executive privilege claim decisively that a former president has registered. Now, as I would have read the statute a few years ago, I would have assumed, and I can go through that, but there's no need for it here, that indeed the final say did lie with the incumbent president, but it has not been tested. And so there's some question now that the Supreme Court itself has validated as a question about some ongoing constitutional interest that a former president has in records uh, that would permit that former president to assert executive privilege, even if the incumbent president disagrees with the claim of privilege. I don't understand that either. I mean, to be honest, I don't think that makes a huge amount of sense. So in those are two examples where the former president, though a private citizen is in a position in one case, very explicitly under the ER, uh, under the PRA, in another case, just by virtue of the fact that it's untested and there are differences of opinion about it, that former president has rights that just don't seem consistent with the reasons why we have these records preservation rules in the first place. So, I, I mean, I think that one theme that's emerged here is, is a lot of 
different legal <laughs> and practical problems with this regime. And, and I mean, I think another one is that the statute itself, right, doesn't really have an enforcement mechanism. Farnoosh, I think, right, what there's being investigated with Mar-a-Lago now is whether classified documents were, were mishandled. I guess, could you talk a little bit about, um, is there any prospect for reform in this area or has this now become so politicized that it's just gonna get lost in the sort of polarization that's in Washington right now? I think because, I mean, the, the non-enforcement aspect of the PRA I think is really important because like you said, the Department of Justice, um, federal prosecutors are not right now Googling how to prosecute someone under the Presidential Records Act because it isn't, you know, first of all, they they can they're focusing on the Espionage Act and, and other similar, more strong statutes in this case. But also because, you know, as as I as many have reported, it is really just the goodwill of the president to to keep these records and to turn them over when his administration ends. You know, and because no former commander in chief has ever been, um, you know, accused of violating the Presidential Records Act or has been convicted of violating the Presidential Records Act, like Bob was mentioning, there isn't a lot of precedent for this. And because it hasn't been tested, it leaves a lot of empty space of, of where things could go. As far as reforms, I mean, this Congress, obviously Democratic controlled Senate and House has spent the majority of the past two years trying to, you know, either investigate um, the former president and his actions um, and his, you know, allies actions on January 6th and also, you know, put in reforms to make sure that an event like January 6th never happens again. Because of the timing of the Mar-a-Lago raid, because of, you know, the timing of when it was made public that the National Archives was missing documents and, you know, two months left in this Congress um, where, Republicans are poised to take control. I don't see that happening um, in the near future, but I think that there, you know, a lot of questions are are raised about does this is this the right mechanism for this, and you know, will this, like Tim said, you know, the only reason we have the Presidential Records Act is because of Richard Nixon. So it'll be interesting to see what this episode, what kind of reform or legislation comes out of it. Thank you. No, that's great. So we have a little bit of time left for questions. I don't know. Do we have any questions? Anyone from the audience? Can I just say one sure. a terminology thing? Um, I know the the common parlance is a the Mar-a-Lago raid. It was a lawfully approved search yes. by the FBI. I should have said that. Uh, no, that's quite all right. It's it's what most people say, but I think we should just specify that yeah. this was, you know. The the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted and judges approved it. So it was a it was a search, not a raid. I just like to add that our government takes very seriously the storage of classified materials, very seriously. There are lots of rules that govern it. There are there is an inspection regime that governs it. And so that alone, leaving aside the Presidential Records Act, which may not be enforceable, the misuse of classified material is actually very enforceable. Um, and um, and we shouldn't be surprised if if members of President former President Trump's staff find themselves in a lot of trouble because the when the National Archives takes control of the presidential records, there is a process by which they acquire control of the classified material, and uh, archivists are very careful about that because they don't want to go to jail, and the Trump's team were not they were not careful. And they face this prospect of jail. They're not careful now. So Tim, I'm actually, I'm curious as someone who's worked with this system, what do you, how do you think it's working? I mean, separate and apart from, from, from the, the, you know, what's happening now and what should we change? Um, four different things. First of all, uh, in the PRA, um, the role of the archiv archivist and of the National Archives is a consultative role. It should be, it, it should actually uh, be a required role. Uh, the White House staff does not have to work with the archives. It does not have to come up with a plan for organizing their materials. That should be a requirement. 
Uh, that's not the case right now. Number two, um, as Bob mentioned, there should be a requirement that within year three, regardless of whether the president wants to run for office, uh, for re-election, there should be a, an exit plan for the materials, and that should be a requirement. And the Congress should be told about that. So Congress, which monitors it, there are two agents, <clears throat> there are one House, one Senate uh, committee that has uh, oversight responsibilities. They should be given a report in year three about the planning for the uh, for the uh, exit or the removal of the materials, and the materials should start moving out beforehand. Uh, three, uh, we need to tighten the definitions of what's of of records. Um, uh, we leave it up. There's a real gray area. Bob was mentioning one thing that's never been tested. Another thing that's never been tested is what is political material, because in the PRA, it's political material not related to the uh, what is it? The discharge of constitutional duties. What the heck is that? The president is also the head of the Democratic Party in the case of Biden or the Republican Party in the case of Trump. When are they not actually engaged in their constitutional duties? We never tested that. Richard Nixon tried, but we never tested it. Similarly, uh, personal records that are not uh, that have no bearing on constitutional duties. That was a challenge for us when we uh, um, um, reviewed the Nixon tapes. When the president is talking to Pat Nixon, the first lady, uh, and they start talking about a trip that she's going to make as first lady, is that a private conversation anymore? No, it isn't actually, and that can be released. These There, there are a lot of gray areas. The reason there are gray areas <clears throat> was that lawyers worked very hard because they understood in 1977 and 78 that you were taking something from the president. Nobody had ever taken property from a president before. That was a big deal. So that's a lot of this is gray. And a lot of it required um, that people work on, in good faith. And as Farnoosh mentioned, we're now in an environment, unfortunately, where you cannot anymore expect elected people to act in good faith. So these are, and finally, I believe that presidential medical records, because the person is commander in chief and we have a nuclear arsenal, should not be private records. When you become president, I think you lose a certain HIPAA power. I think because, and that's not to say that the presidential medical records should be made available during the presidency, not at all, because we don't want foreign adversaries to know if our president is sick, but it should be understood that after the death of the president and the first lady, that material is available. Why? Because we don't want families keeping presidents in office who are not able to do the job. They ought to know that they will be found out. Finally, tax returns. Presidents should lose the, their right to keep their tax returns private when they're president. We need to know if they're making money off of the presidency. Again, that could be protected until well after the death, their death and the death of the first lady or first gentleman someday. Those are mistakes, again, that were made in the PRA period because of this negotiation. I think Trump has taught us we should, we should not expect our presidents to show good faith. We should tighten our control and uh, of presidential records. So actually, I, we got one question from the audience that I want to I want to run by you. Um, I, this entire conversation ties into a broader question about government secrecy, right? So the the question, and maybe Bob, you could address this: is if someone, anyone, can briefly describe um, how documents are declassified. But I think maybe you know, and this is actually something the Brennan Center has done quite a bit of work on. We have a an overclassification problem in in this uh, in in our government right now. Maybe talk a little bit about how this relates to that, the broader sort of question of government secrecy, and then what is the process for for declassifying documents? That is a very complicated question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure I can I can cover that in a, 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 in a minute. But but yeah. I, I will, I'll, I'll I'll focus on uh, the question that various groups, I assume the Brennan Center has been active on this point, concerned about overclassification. It has, by the way, been um, addressed by some presidents. Uh, President Obama notably issued an executive order governing the class declassification of documents and tried to put a break on or to put introduce some control, some awareness of the risks of, of uh, overclassification. Um, I want to say one thing on behalf of the people inside the White House who are all behind closed doors, which you correctly would correctly point out. 
yes, there is an element in the classification of documents that could be attributed to, uh, call it bureaucratic overkill, laziness, easier to classify than not to classify, desire to avoid embarrassment, just classify and keep the document under classification wraps. Um, but there's also a lot at stake in some of those classification decisions. And uh, so, uh, yes, it may be that there's overkill, but oftentimes, and this is something that you're really struck by when you go into the government for an extended period of time. I did that when I went into the Obama administration, but prior to that time, I was only in and out of government for very, very short periods of time. I didn't really appreciate it, but there are real pressures to be careful about the use of information, the potential misuse of information, the potential, pardon me, leak of information. Um, there are legitimate concerns about this that I think drive, uh, certainly in the defense and national security area, but just generally drive a worry about what it means for governance for certain kinds of information to circulate widely outside the government, to be subject to misconstrual, to be subject to misuse and so forth. So uh, I, I just wanna say, if you speak to people, and I think there have been you know, critics of overclassification in the government, certainly in my party, but once they're in the government, the perspective sometimes shifts. I do wanna make that point. And I think that the perspective can shift about the, the Presidential Records Act, too, once you're actually in the White House wondering if your email is going to be dug up by a story. Yeah, two quick, just quick real comments. First yeah. of all, you, you recall the this is not a Presidential Records Act issue, but during the Obama administration, um, there was a decision to make the waves records of visitors to the White House public. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, everybody found that, you know, even though only periodically released, there was you know, information about who was coming into the building for meetings. At the time, across the street, there was a coffee shop called Caribou, and that suddenly saw a huge increase in business uh, as people decided they needed a cup of coffee in order to conduct a particular meeting, so they met outside the building. The second thing on PRA reform, if I could just add one more thing, there's a provision of PRA reform, and I don't know, you would likely know, or maybe one of my co-panelists knows, that actually permits the president to destroy documents that the president concludes have no historic or other value warning preservation. And the archivist is brought into it in yes. a consultative yeah. role yeah. and the president has to advise Congress in advance if that's what the president intends to do. That could go. Why should the president be sitting in the Oval Office trying to decide which documents to destroy or as it turns out, flush down the toilet? So I think we're, we have probably just time for one more question. I guess maybe, Lindsay, I might give you the last word. Um, you know, where do you, looking at the broad scope of the presidency, where do you see this heading? Um, do you think that we are going to maintain this, this notion of the presidency as a, a public property where we will preserve these records or do you do you see maybe a more trend towards administrations chafing at this at these requirements and trying to claim more secrecy as they had earlier in American history well historians are notoriously terrible future predictors so I, I do need to give that I'm just caveat. I'm asking all these <laughs> but yeah um I I mean as as Bob said both Bob and Tim pointed out it's kind of weird that we treat the presidents the way that we do. The nation was founded with the idea that we didn't want a monarchy and we wanted an average citizen who came into office and had a lot of power, but then left office and was just an average citizen again. And the fact that we have kind of abandoned that notion such that when a former president passes away, there's like a royal procession for like a week uh, leading up to that that process is a little bit bizarre. And, and I mean, even the concept of President's Day is a, is a little bit weird if you think about it. And so I think that the last decade in particular have encouraged a lot of Americans to think about, yes, we should absolutely respect the office. We should absolutely, I think, you know, treat it a little bit differently. It, it requires decisions that most people can't make and have no business wanting to make. 
but the people are just people. And so the things that they produce, the records that they produce belong to the American people. They don't belong to them. They don't have any special ownership rights. And so I think one silver lining of the crazy partisan space that we're currently in is it is challenging us a little bit to think about whether or not the presidency should be something different. And I suspect that even if presidents do want to be more secretive, the partisan atmosphere won't permit that because there will be another party constantly chomping at the bit to get that information. Now, that obviously has a lot of downsides, and I'm not suggesting that the intense partisan warfare we're currently in is, is a good thing overall, but I, I would have trouble imagining we're ever going to go back to a place where presidents are just allowed to decide what is theirs and what is not. I don't think judges will permit it. I don't think lawyers will permit it. And I would like to think the American people wouldn't permit it. So I think that on that note, I believe we are at time. Um, on behalf of the Bradamus Center, the Brennan Center, and NYU Votes, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for this really wonderful conversation. Um, and thanks to all of you uh, who are here in the audience and, and watching online. Um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you.